please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first Kai Talk of this year. Um, uh, these Kai Talks are hosted by the UPF Center for Animal Ethics in Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. And it is with great pleasure uh, that we bring a new edition of the talks where we have these conversations with animal advocates that may be of interest for scholars, activists, and the public in general. And today we have with us Natalie Casal and Nuri Almiron, co-editors of the volume Like an Animal, Critical Animal Studies Approaches to Borders, Displacement, and Othering, which came up on uh, 2021 and was edited by Brill. Uh, we will be talking about this fantastic book today, here. <laughs> 2021, I don't know what I said right now, <laughs> but it was last year, sorry. And uh, first, I would like to introduce our guest. So Dr. Natalie Casal is an assistant professor at Georgia Institute of Technology and American Council of Learned Societies, fellow for her work on Arab uh, atheists. She studies the links among disenfranchisement, media, and language. Among her co-authored publications on critical animal studies are articles on speciesism in the US and Spanish media and EU policy on vivisection, as well as her co-edited volume that shows how we can bend the arc of moral universe toward justice for human and non-human refugees and migrants called Like an Animal, the book we are going to talk about today. Dr. Cazal is the author of Pretty Liar, Television, Language and Gender in Wartime Lebanon, uh, which shows how Lebanese people demanded um, responsive media at times of unrest and deep social di di divisions. And she's also a contributor for global media and strategic narratives of contested democracy. Dr. Casal is on the advisory board of Ideas Beyond Borders, an organization that promotes the free exchange uh, of ideas and defends human rights from extremists and authoritarian regimes in the Arab world. Um, she also served as the founding faculty advisor to the first Texas chapter of No Loss Generation, a student initiative for global refugee and migrant crisis rela relief efforts. And she was nominated for the Achievements in Climate and Inclusion uh, Award at Texas University for encouraging and facilitating more inclusive and welcoming climate for all. And we also have with us Dr. Nuri Almiron, who you may have already seen as a presenter of this Sky Talk series. Uh, she is the co-director of the UPF Center for Animal Ethics and a tenured professor in the Department of Communication at Pompeo Fabra University. Her main areas of research include and combine the ethics uh, and political economy of communication, particularly uh, interest groups and persuasive communication with critical animal studies, climate change, animal advocacy, and interspecies ethics. Her work has been published in academic journals such as Climatic Change, Journal of Agricultural and Environmental Ethics, Environmental Politics, Journalism Studies, Environmental Communication, International Journal of Communication, or European Journal of Communication. Uh, she's co-author of Like an Animal and co-editor, um, and she has also been a, research, a visiting researcher in various universities. Uh, she's coordinating the MA in International Studies on Media Power and Difference, and the coordinator of the research project COMPASS, uh, Loving and Compassion, Interest Groups, Discourse, and Non-Human Animals in Space. So, well, thank you very much, both of you, for being here and for accepting to talk with us, with us about Like an Animal. I'm very excited. So, well, to start the conversation, uh, I would like to invite you to briefly introduce the book content to our audience. Uh, how would you describe Like an Animal uh, in a few words? The, the book, in a few words, I would say that the book is about the two most disenfranchised, the two most disempowered groups on the planet. First, the non-human animals that are affected by humans, and second, this is human refugees and human migrants. And, and also the book is about how we have failed both of them and what, of the, what are the connections between them in terms of how we portray them, how we think about them, 
what uh, kinds of policies we institute uh, that relate and affect each of these groups and how we can overcome some of the um, some of the negatives that come with these kinds of policies and ideas and concepts. Mm -hmm. Yes, I may add to this that, well, first of all, thank you, Laura, for this wonderful presentation of both of us and for being uh, conversating with us. And thank you also to Roxanne Gamper, who is at the production today. I would add to this excellent summary by Natalie that this is, a, I think, a very original approach an idea that Natalie had, and then when she presented to me, I I thought, I have no time, I'm too busy, but this is really exciting because it's one of these intersecting approaches so difficult to do. And I think the book is a very good example on, on this, on an intersecting gaze. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It is It is quite interesting how you managed to collect all these different chapters and create this amazing volume. Um, I'm also a bit curious about how a project like this book with so many and many um, very diverse contribution is materialized. Uh, how was the process of thinking about this book and uh, making it real? And also, why did you decide it was necessary to promote this critical animal studies approach to borders, displacement, and othering? Thank you for this question, Laura. Um, for me, this started, the whole idea started like as a light bulb when I was teaching a class um, on globalization. And um, I added, um, you know, some themes in the class about refugees, um, and some of my students actually, because the class was based on projects, they had to come up with projects and actually do something in order to um, incorporate and reach out to minorities, um, and that was in Texas. So some of my students actually started a chapter of a student organization that was connecting refugees with different NGOs, with the government and with the private sector in order to help these refugees. And they told me that they were really inspired by all the ideas of the class and how we were looking at these themes. And then I started thinking about it. You know, like we were talking about refugees and human refugees, but I have so much um, information about non-human animals who are also de facto refugees because of all the human activities. And so I decided to really delve into this topic and really my two students inspired me to take a more in-depth look and to compare the different approaches we have to these kinds of topics and to realize that we really have a huge lack of um, of discussion, both in academic uh, circles and also in, in the public sphere in general about how non-human animals are refugees, how we affect them, and also how human refugees are being animalized. That was something very important. And this is where the, the critical animal studies angle came for me because of that frequent and widespread misunderstanding that human rights and the rights of non-human animals are something completely different. They're not connected. And for us to champion human rights, um, we need to distance ourselves from animals. Uh, and that's like the road to become more human and have more human rights. I basically realized um, that we can make uh, a contribution to that field. Yes, exactly. I cannot put it better. But it's true that there was a, a clear gap a research gap and a reflection gap in both areas, in critical animal studies and in bo critical border and uh, other otherness studies. And, and always this, when you want to fill these type of gaps, uh, it's very difficult because uh, uh, in general, people don't have the expertise in both areas. So you have to, to do an effort from your space to introduce your topic into the other space. But I think we have been very successful. All, all the authors have been very successful in, in this intertwining of, of the two areas. But it's true that the border studies were not, of course, were not addressing speciesism. 
And critical animal studies, there, there are, of course, some reflections about uh, dehumanization for sure, but not focused on refugees, migrants, on, on these topics that we address in, in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess maybe you already answered this question, but I wanted to know if you if you have like an intended public of this volume. I understand you wanted to affect it with both these both fields, these both areas of knowledge, but also, uh, yeah, like did you have or a, an intended public when you thought uh, the project of the book? And also, how do you consider uh, like an animal can impact uh, these these two academic fields? And if you have already had any feedback uh, about the book and its academic and social impact, and you want to share that with us, that would be great too. I can start with the second question, which is, okay. you know, what kind of feedback and maybe impact this book um, yeah, is having. And there is a lot of interest, both in animal rights academic uh, outlets um, that talk about academic books on animal rights um, and animal issues, and also in human rights outlets, um, especially in terms of, you know, black issues. The book was advertised in the Atlanta Global Studies Center. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, also, um, it was, I presented, I talked about it on a, uh, an echo radio uh, show podcast called In Tune with Nature or In Tune to Nature. Um, I also talked about it on uh, a podcast called The Unchained Podcast. Um, which talks about black issues. Um, I talked about it on the Canadian uh, radio station um, that has a program called Always for Animal Rights. And I talked about it um, on an issue about journalism and speciesism uh, for Dr. Um, uh, Shabhan O'Sullivan podcast on knowing animals. There mm -hmm. always, uh, there also is an interest in the book by uh, different journalists who would like to place book reviews um, in different magazine, magazines, for instance, um, you know, Boston Review or LA Review of Books. And we are in communication with these journalists to uh, hopefully write a review um, about the book. Wow, that's fantastic. Regarding the first question, we, we were addressing, of course, the both the scholars in both areas, in borders, other and in critical animal studies, and of course students in in any of these fields. I was for sure thinking, in for instance, my students at the MA in international studies in media power and difference. The book has a second section which is fully devoted to representation, so it's very much fitting uh, this type of of uh, syllabus we have in, in this type of masters. Fantastic, yeah. I, I agree that it fits a lot as I as I know the master personally. Um, okay, that's that's fantastic. I'm very happy to know this this book has had this this welcome around diverse uh, formats and and media. Um, now I would like to ask you about some of the key ideas and concepts that are presented in the book. For instance, uh, you talk about the human non-human divide. Uh, and in the book, there's a series of chapters dedicated to explore uh, how this divide can be deconstructed. So um, can you please define the human on human divide to our audience and explain to us your suggestions? Uh, like maybe also briefly some of the book contributors suggestions uh, for it to be deconstructed and challenged. Thank you for this question, Laura. I consider this to be the most important question uh, that you can ask about this book. And I really appreciate that you are asking us also to talk about all the contributors in the book, because oftentimes um, I'm asked to talk about the two chapters that I wrote, um, and that leaves other contributors not really, um, f that leaves the public not really familiar as much with other contributors, but they have uh, written uh, phenomenal chapters. And I would like to present very briefly what their chapters is about um, because, you know, that adds a lot of information um, about the book in general. So, for, 
first, I'll briefly find the human-non-human divide. Basically, this is kind of a line in the sand, so to speak. And on one side of the line, we have humans. And on the other line of the sand, we have non-human animals. And basically, this means that there are qualitative and quantitative differences between humans and non-humans to such a degree that we cannot have um, many commonalities in terms of policy, in terms of representation, in terms of rights, um, in terms of how we interact with each other. So really, really important consequences because of this divide. If somebody is on the side of humans, then they have rights, then they have um, you know, uh, resources, then they have health, whatnot, they have positive identification. But if they end up on, on the side of non-humans, whether they are actual humans or, or other non-human animals, um, they are deprived of rights, they can be killed, they can be abused, they can be eaten, um, they can be harmed, they can be uh, chased away from their homes, and that has no consequences. So this huge divide or the deep, the hard divide, as we call it, is the human non-human divide. And it really is not just a divide, you know, we just separate different species, but it's a divide that has consequences. And these consequences are that uh, those who are on the side of non-humans uh, uh, in this divide tend to, um, to be abused and to be harmed and killed and their deaths and their abuse um, uh, is, is unpunished and is not prevented. Um, in terms of the whole structure of the book and all the co contributors chapters, we um, are organized about, uh, we are organized around two related themes. The first theme is that non-humans are not recognized really as refugees, since the book is about uh, migrants and refugees. Um, Non-humans are not recognized as refugees um, in, in the many, many instances um, where human activity causes them to become de facto refugees, to leave their home and their habitat um, and, and go somewhere else, or to be taken somewhere else. And how um, these kinds of refugees, non-human refugees, should have a certain degree of, or certain remediation. Um, we also haven't, the second theme is that we also haven't recognized the most important root of dehumanization. Uh, and by dehumanization, I mean um, portraying other humans as being on the other side of the divide, as being non-human, as being just human in shape, but not being human in essence, which is the, you know, the big um, the public view about that. You know, they are not really, really human. They don't have the same human qualities as whoever is defined as human. So we haven't really recognized that, um, that um, the human and non-human divide lies at the center of dehumanization. It is the most important root of dehumanization. And this book, really, all the contributors um, to this book want to bend the arc of, of the uh, moral universe towards justice and to show that there are a lot of commonalities between the different forms of oppression of humans and, and non-human uh, animals. So um, I'm going to let um, uh, Nuria speak about her chapter since it is the first chapter, and then I will continue um, talking about the, the other chapters. Nuria? Thanks, Natalie. Yes, well, actually, my chapter, I start focusing on this divide in, in, and more, more, more particularly explaining how racism is based on this divide and how this dehumanization is actually an animalization and uh, how this is something that must be acknowledged if we want to address uh, not only, of course, the oppression of non-humans, but also the oppression of humans. What I do in my chapter is uh, particularly to talk about this uh, in, in the area of the representation of uh, this, this distant suffering, which is how it's called usually in communication studies, the representation of the suffering of these others, which in general in communication studies refers to humans, but of course it can also be non-humans. And what I do in my chapter is 
to go back into history to explain the roots of racism and this divide which has so harmful consequences for humans and non-humans. And then I, I pick up a, a very interesting book by Lili Chuliraki, which is a, a, a wonderful text uh, pointing at the problems of media coverage and representation in general of distant suffering for humans. And I identify how she actually is pointing at the divide without problematizing. So she's identifying that the problem is in this dehumanization, which is rooted in the divide and the distinction between non-humans and humans, but without problematizing this dualism. And then if you don't problematize it, you cannot dismantle it. You cannot address the root of the problem. And, and then what could I just do is to show how in this case, the ethics of communication is really, really very, very almost there. It's just a step away of being able to see this species dualism behind a criticism that they are already making, but not acknowledging uh, the problem of dualism because they don't have this species or non-species perspective that we include in our in our volume and that I particularly include in, in my chapter for uh, communication ethics. So that would be more, more or less my, my chapter. Thank you, Nuria. The second chapter um, was written by uh, Garrett uh, Bonyak. And this chapter really uses some insights from the work of Chicana feminists. And he um, really shows how the representation of non-human animals, the representation of, uh, of animality, of you know, these animal kind of qualities are used by certain groups to legitimize racism, sexism, um, and nationalism, specifically in, in American culture, but not just American culture. This is happening, you know, uh, globally. And he argues that um, the link between how uh, migrants and non-human animals are put together by these people um, is marks women, people of color, migrants, and also non-human animals as inferior, and it poses it it puts them in some kind of a hierarchy where there is this idealized white male citizen with a passport, and these other groups are really inferior. Um, in our fourth chapter, we have two contributors, Atsuko Matsuoka and John Sorensen. Um, who, who examine two types of tropes. And tropes, you can think of them as um, phrases that are used with specific purposes, and they're always used for these purposes. Um, these phrases that they uh, examine are um, like animals, and then the second phrase is, phrase is treated like animals. So they show us how these phrases appear very commonly when um, certain groups accuse others, such as immigrants, like immigrants are animals. Im immigrants are like animals. They do such and such and such, and therefore we should not provide any help. Um, they should not have any rights, etc., etc. And then the second um, group uh, of people that these kinds of phrases are used are by those who resist the animalization of, of migrants and they say oh we were treated like animals and we shouldn't be treated like animals we should be treated better than animals and so these two authors show these connections both between those who um, use these phrases in order to animalize um, immigrants and both and as well those who are trying to get rid of the animalization in the end, both of them, uh, both these groups actually end up more and more animalizing uh, refugees and migrants, and also, um, um, and also, I guess, uh, protecting and perpetuating uh, speciesism um, or the uh, prejudice um, that uses different species prejudice, um, like racism, but instead of racism, 
um, it uses species to mark certain groups as uh, good groups and bad groups. Um, and then we have one last chapter in the first section, which is about the, the human-non-human divide by Deborah Merskin, who explores how animals or non-human animals are the ultimate other and everything that goes with that, from denying them certain rights to uh, being portrayed very, very negatively um, by uh, societies and, and, and different groups in societies. She also explores different tensions between groups, social justice groups, for instance, groups that are animal rights groups, groups that are human rights groups, and how we can bridge that divide between the two groups. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you for introducing all these chapters, Natalie, because I think with this, uh, we will have uh, a mental image of, of how the book looks like. Um, also, uh, I know there are two other parts. Uh, there's one about more focused on policy, advocacy and laws. And then there's like a third one about media representation in which I had the, the pleasure to contribute to. Uh, so, well, if you can also explain the, these two other parts a bit and the, the introduce the chapters briefly. Yes, sure. So the second uh, section of the book, it talks about policy um, and issues that are related to policy. Um, the first chapter in this section was written by Erin Evans and she explains how neoliberal policies actually promote destruction, destruction of the environment. Um, they promote non-human animal abuse. They promote human worker abuse. Um, and they also seek to dismantle or to decrease public funding, social programs. Um, and she really talks about how all of these basically result in um, not being able to provide care to others um, and how structurally the way we provide care is really neglected or deprived. Um, she talks about how uh, activists are using that particular development, you know, the neglect of care or the deprivation of, of care in a structural way as a system, how activists are using this in order to, um, to galvanize uh, care workers in order to um, galvanize um, especially those of them who are um, themselves climate refugees because many of the care workers end up being climate refugees or they start as uh, climate refugees. And she also talks about how we can bolster social programs uh, that provide care, for instance, universal health care, increased education, um, and the funding that goes with that. The second mm -hmm. chapter in this uh, section of the book was written by Charlotte uh, Blattner. Um, and it is an amazing chapter about how human and non-human animal migrations or migrants are treated very differently under the law. It's almost like each belongs to two separate worlds, one for humans and one for non-humans. Um, she, uh, she proves really that the law um, is is not equipped well to deal with the shocks of the climate of climate uh, change, um, and um, and because of that, we really have to do something. She suggests that um, some policy goals, some measures, uh, are desperately needed so that that we can avert a global migration crisis. We actually do have, but we can, uh, you know, we have well, um, a global migration uh, crisis, but we can avert it further developing and, 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 and continuing. Um, and she also talks about how we can build up interspecies uh, resilience in this chapter. And then the last chapter in this section um, was written by Stephen Best, um, who is one of the founders of, of Critical Animal Studies. Um, so he examines in this very, very interesting chapter how um, the, there is a flawed security model um, and how immigration policies in the United States are really, really flawed, um, starting from all the way from Clinton, from the Clinton administration through uh, the Bush administration, um, the Obama administration, and then to the Trump administration. 
um, and how the migrant crisis in the United States um, is having a catastrophic effect on uh, many, many different human communities, on non-human animals. They're having a catastrophic effect on biodiversity, on the environment. Um, Stephen Best also talks about how um, a new migrant detention industrial complex, kind of a machinery almost, uh, yeah. equipment, the technology has emerged and um, he sees the building of the border wall between the US and and Mexico kind of a new front a new stage in the war against um, free living animals what we call wildlife so this was the you know the section about policy um, in this book and then we have another section about uh, which is on media which talk about, mm -hmm. talks about uh, media representations uh, of the divide in the world. And that includes in the Arab world, in Turkey, in Eastern Europe and the West. We're very happy that we were able to represent that, not just in the US, um, but also in, in, in many other uh, parts of the world. Um, the first chapter in this section is my chapter where I talk, where I compare the press coverage in uh, Bulgaria um, which is part of the European Union, and also Lebanon, an Arabic-speaking uh, country in the Middle East. Um, because these two countries are really two of the host countries that are closest to Syria, um, there are others as well, but they, they, they are two of the, the ones that are close to Syria, and they were directly affected by the refugee crisis. And in this chapter, I really show how um, speciesism as framework is used globally, how all of these issues that relate to refugees really are boiled down to, to non-human animals and speciesism and animalization, animalizing refugees. Um, the second chapter uh, in this section was written by um, Sejan Ergin Zengin, I hope I pronounced the, right, the name correctly, who discusses that? Um, who discusses really animal metaphors in, on Turkish social media that relate to that describe Syrian refugees and really denigrate them um, in that in that uh, um, specific media form? She analyzes um, the role of different uh, metaphors that compare refugees to animals um, or call them, you know, animalize them. Um, such as, you know, that their Syrian refugees are inferior, Syrian refugees are breeding rapidly, they're being out of control, they are exploiting Turkish resources, or they're being uncivilized. Um, and you can see here really the effect of, of speciesism and the divide between animals and, and uh, human and non-human animals. Um, in these kinds of media. And then the last chapter in the book was written by Claire Parkinson. She shows um, that there are significant intersections between Oops. I think we lost you, Natalie. Between oh, human, okay. non-human uh, animals and okay. Brexit. And uh, she shows how um, the depiction of non-human animals in um, and also Romanian immigrants to the UK um, in the UK press, how they were depicted since 2007. And she shows how these depictions are connected with capitalism and with consumption um, mm -hmm. and how nationalistic rhetoric really affects these representations. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And there is missing your chapter, Laura. <laughs> yeah, maybe I will just mention some a few words about it. Um, if you want to share, okay, uh, I don't hear the you anymore. Oh, can you can you hear me, Natalie? No, I don't hear you. No. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah, I hear you. Yes. I don't hear you. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Let me leave and come back. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, I can maybe talk about my chapter. What do you think? Yes, go ahead, I think, yes. Yeah, and so I, I can use this space uh, of technical. 
uh, issues. Um, so I basically did a visual content analysis on on uh, press coverage on visual like the for press photographs of uh, how human and non-human migrants were represented in different cases. Uh, in the case of human migrants, I researched the U.S.-Mexico border uh, situation and the migrant caravan. Um, and in the case of non-humans, I, I thought about uh, climate refugees in um, the, for, for instance, the Ebro floodings in Spain and the aftermath of the Hurricane Irma and the Hurricane Florence in the U.S. So uh, I explored how the New York Times, The Guardian and El País in Spain, that uh, these three worldwide influenced um, journals represented uh, images, uh, sorry, uh, refugees. Yes, this one's like a picture from Joan MacArthur and it was um, published in The Guardian. And it was one of the, the only ones represented uh, representing farmed animals. That's something uh, I reflect about on the, on the book, how the work of uh, animal photojournalists such as John MacArthur, and also we have an example in the Spanish press from Aitor Garmendia, uh, from the peaks uh, affected by the Ebro flooding, how they were um, kind of breaking the silence of, of these groups uh, within uh, Visual, visual representation. Uh, so, in general, my, my my conclusion would be that media depictions uh, play an important role in othering both human and, and non-human animal refugees, and and they manufacture also the concept about uh, class, classicism, racism, uh, white supremacy, and speciesism, and also criminalization of poverty. Yeah, we had another example there on how. Uh, 13 animals are framed as threatened, while other animals are framed, for instance, as threat within this climate crisis, as for, as for instance, uh, some snakes and other, other animals. So it was also so very interesting to, to see how different species uh, were framed uh, differently. And also regarding humans, um, also how uh, certain humans, uh, for instance, the, the migrant caravan case, they were um, represented as crowds and therefore sometimes uh, despersonalized, they, they, they individualized. Yeah, here we see this picture from Go Nakamura and, and the studies and the research show how this kind of, of approach of photographic uh, depiction can, can promote distance from, from the 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 migrants instead of their of knowing their personal their personal uh, experiences and individual stories but i don't want to use more space to talk about my chapter <laughs> i want to keep uh, interviewing you i don't know if natalie is already here no she she's not here yeah, yeah she's yes here i'm now. here can you hear me oh fantastic <laughs> you appeared like <laughs> yes i, I yes. can hear you can you hear me yes i can hear you Perfect. Okay. I just present briefly and a bit uh, chaotically my chapter. So I hope uh, at least with the photographs, I think uh, people can be more interested in, in reading it. Yeah. So thank you for presenting <laughs> it. I really appreciate it. And your chapter was also part of the media section of the book. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I was so happy to, to be part of the book too. And it was such an interesting research to do actually. So, well, uh, I also wanted to, to ask you about uh, how you argue and you, you explain how dehumanization, you, you already introduced that, but I want you to, to broader explain uh, if you can, how dehumanization is not possible without considering speciesism. And what is therefore the central point you are making in this volume about this, this fact, this issue? Do you want me to answer, Natalie, or, uh, uh, or as you prefer? Um, go ahead, Nuria, and, and yeah, maybe I'll add something afterwards. Well, so the, the, the question was uh, about uh, why we cannot dismantle dehumanization and racism if mm -hmm. we do not tackle speciesism. Yes. Well, I would say, uh, at least as I explained it in my chapter, in, and 
how I have it in my mind, but probably there are other ways to, to put it. For, for dehumanizing someone, you need, of course, first to create this, this image, not just the split between humans and non-humans, but a derogatory category for the ones who, are, who have not this human essence. Uh, does you have to devalue the non-humans? So in order to be able to dismantle dehumanizing, you have to get rid of the concept of animal as a derogatory concept, and of course, devaluing non-human animals. As long as we devalue non-human animals, we will have this reference to compare the, non the humans we want to devalue as well. So they are intertwined in a way that uh, it's impossible to dismantle racism if you do not understand that you need to stop devaluing non-human animals. In this case, we could, of course, make the comparison uh, with, other, with other categories. We could have done this and we can do it with plants, for instance, but we mostly do it with non-humans. As I have said before, dehumanizing is animalizing. And animalizing is wrong because of this derogatory building construction of the concept of non-human animals. I'm that sure you can really... prove it. Yeah, this is really, really well said, uh, Maria. I, I appreciate you um, taking you know, the lead on answering this question. I, I just want to um, add that we're talking here about animal animalistic dehumanization because we also have um, mechanistic dehumanization where you know you can dehumanize as robots uh, you know as machines but we're talking about the uh, animalization really and if you look at theories on dehumanization um, that um, you know have been presented before us um, they talk how um, you know they try really to invent a specific human nature that is different from other animals. Um, uh, take the example, the famous example that uh, the bee works to uh, to collect honey, um, but she doesn't labor. Only a, a human baker who bakes bread labors. So only human work is labor. The you know the non-human work of other species is not labor. So from here we already see the divide, the human-non-human -human, uh, divide, and then jump a little bit more, and we go to look how minorities and refugees are being described very often. They're lazy, you know. They don't want to labor. They just want to take our money, our free, you know, help, uh, finances, um, and so you see the. Um, how dehumanization really um, that helps to um, to um, uh, oppress and disenfranchise um, and other other human uh, other human groups. So speciesism, this divide between humans and non-humans, lies at the bottom of uh, dehumanization of other humans. Um, or there's like other theories of that are specific for instance higher emotions are only felt by humans such as shame pride um, you name it but other human uh, other non-human animals allegedly don't have any of these higher um, uh, emotions and so from here you can see that this also could be used to dehumanize minorities um, and this has been done over and over again because certain human groups, when they are competing for resources, um, you know, intrinsically people have compassion. Individuals or groups um, who want to profit often feel compassion for other groups with whom they're competing. And in order for them to actually go ahead and harm these other groups and benefit themselves, they go through the mental you know, process of first dehumanizing these groups and then, then saying, okay, well, if they're on the side of animals in, in the divide, it's okay to harm them because animals don't feel these emotions, they don't have rights, you know, they really, they can be freely killed, harmed, or even eaten. And so you see how this really lies at the bottom. Mm -hmm. If I may add something else to this very good description by Natalie, we, we, in doing this, in addressing this issue, in addressing the need of dismantling the speciesism behind racism, 
what we are doing also is addressing the political economy of how the world is constructed. Because the modern concept of racism is something created for a purpose. And also the, the dualisms that that uh, emerge in at least in Western societies in the ancient Greek Greece uh, are dualisms that are created because of a need of justify behavior. And uh, Richard Rorty put it very well when he said that these dualisms are not discovered, are not something we discover are there, but are a creation by us. And our creation and the building because of some elites and some people wanting to keep their privileges. In the ancient Greece, uh, they did so because they had slavery, human slavery, and they, it was a, a very powerful economic resource for them to keep slavery as a main, main pillar of their economies. And all this, all this construction of human slaves as animals were just for keeping the privileges of some, the, the ones exploiting those humans. And then the idea of racism, which is very well theorized by a number of uh, anti-racist theorists, explaining how it was totally linked to the colonial era and how it's a construction. Also, David Navarro explains very well how all this is a construction after we start this exploitation of uh, non-human animals or, or humans after we need to justify what we do and this justification is uh, this construction of this human essence on top of everything so i think it's very important to keep this in mind because it's not just a theory or a philosophical issue it's also how uh, all the inequalities in the planet are built on top of this yeah yeah, I don't think it could be better explained. <laughs> so I think uh, we still don't have any um, any questions from the public, from the audience. Please, Roxanne, let me know in case we have some. And if you are listening to us and you want to ask something to Nuri and Natalie, you can let us know. Uh, but I will uh, use this opportunity to uh, ask you some specific questions about your chapters. Um, so, for instance, Natalie, in your in your fantastic chapter, the press outside the West, that you already introduced, um, displacement, refugees, and non-human animals in Bulgaria and Lebanon, you explored uh, how the Bulgarian and Lebanese press represent refugees and immigrants, and one of your main conclusions is that refugees and migrants are animalized in in these press representations. So, um, uh, could you share with us some of the frames you recognized in your research? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question, Laura. Yes, this chapter actually, um, I started this chapter because of a personal experience I had both in Bulgaria and Lebanon. When I was in Bulgaria, um, my grandparents, you know, long ago, they actually moved after they retired to a small town near the Turkish border to, between Turkey and Bulgaria. Um, and then um, afterwards, um, another person moved also to that place um, who was the principal of a school. When he finished, he actually relocated and started living there. So this person is called Costa. And I found that the uh, German media during the crisis, the refugee crisis, actually wrote a whole article about him because he was really humanizing, so to speak, or he was treating the passing refugees who passed from uh, Syria, Turkey, Bulgaria on, on their way to uh, Germany. Um, he was really helping them. He was feeding them. You know, he was giving them water, bread. He was helping them with with whatever they needed. And he really said to them, they are humans, they are just like you and me. So compare that experience to an experience I had in Lebanon where I was renting an apartment and the manager of this apartment, he wanted to immigrate to Poland um, and he was really upset that there were so many refugees migrating to Poland and, and he called them animals. He said, these animals, they are, you know, making uh, um, and everything bad for, for, for people like us who deserve to, to migrate. And I was really shocked because uh, the difference between Lebanese, the Lebanese and the Syrians um, is it, really very small. I mean, they are two different countries, but they have been, um, you know, uh, two different countries um, in, 
you know, for less than less than a century. Um, and they have so many commonalities. So I really wanted to explore how Syrian refugees and refugees in general are portrayed in the media of these two countries. Um, in the Bulgarian case, I discovered that uh, one of the frames that actually shocked me was uh, the, you know, um, a refugee. Um, there, there were people who were hunting for refugees. One of them was called Dinko. Um, and he was really infamous in, in, in Bulgarian media. He was going out with tanks. He was, you know, trying to get uh, a, a whole um, a posse group of people with him with guns to go and patrol the borders and so to speak, to kill refugees. Um, we don't think that he has killed anybody, but you know, it, it was a whole thing about in the media, how refugees were compared really to animals to be hunted, you know, with guns, um, etc. cetera. Um, and where I com when I compare that to how refugees were and, and, and animal issues were presented in the Lebanese media, um, I noticed that there was the, you know, there was also the, the, the frame that animalized refugees, but there was also another frame that tried to um, recover them, to rehumanize them. But even that frame was really um, very deeply ingrained with, uh, with speciesism. Um, with speciesism, for instance, somebody compared refugees, Palestinian refugees, to uh, a, a tiger who was in a zoo and they said something like that you know poor Palestinian refugees they um, will never be able to escape Gaza the city in, in you know in Israel they could never escape Gaza whereas this uh, you know tiger from the zoo he's free you know he's free to escape anytime so to speak he uh, he wants and so you know to compare how the Palestinian refugees were placed, um, you know, even under the tiger for the purpose of the audiences be, uh, you know, becoming very, very upset, thinking that tigers and other animals are really, you know, just having a, a, a nice day and, and enjoying themselves, whereas the refugees are being treated worse than, than animals. And also on that media, they were calling people who were abusive, etc. They were calling them, you know, animals in human forms. How could you do that, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Or they were saying refugees themselves were using that frame, and they were saying, you know, like we were treated, of course, like animals. Even chickens live better than us. You know, even chickens have a better house than than we have. Um, and so these, you know, these kinds of frames really show that the media is really filled with speciesism and, um, and the human-animal divide um, regulates and helps us imagine issues of human refugees and also uh, issues of other animals. Well, fantastic. Thank you for your answer and your explanation. It was quite, quite uh, good to see also the, the photographs and have this mental map of how news are shaping these, these issues. Also, Nuria, I wanted to ask you regarding your chapter. Uh, I really like your proposal for a sentient, compassionate, cosmopolitan solidarity as like an ethica, ethics of communication proposal. Could you please explore this, like introduce to us a bit more this proposal? And also, if you can explain why do you think the humanist approach is a lagging horizon for communicating solidarity? Yes, well, uh, yes, I, f I finished the chapter with this proposal of uh, sentient and, cosmo and compassionate cosmopolitan solidarity because the claim to cosmopolitanism is very common in a number of uh, ethics nowadays, but also in, in the ethics of communication. For instance, Lily Chuliraki and Stephen Ward, uh, two very, very two excellent uh, communication scholars, they, they make this, this claim of going for cosmopolitan solidarity. And what I, I do at the end of my chapter is to stress the fact that this claim, as it is done so far, in, in, in my case, I, I am talking about communication ethics, but I, I think we can uh, go beyond communication ethics. This claim is, is made on top of a humanitarian rhetoric 
which is just perpetuating the divide we have been talking about here during this hour. So uh, I simply say we have to get rid of this humanitarian rhetoric. And mm -hmm. because the humanitarian rhetoric means that the claim is for a cosmopolitanism uh, based in, on a humanitarian imaginary, which is that we humans have this special human essence that allows us to be benevolent and to be uh, this benevolence and this impartiality and this justice and fairness that are involved in the cosmopolitanism theory and cosmopolitanism in general, which are very good. But if you run this and humanitarianism, uh, of course, the problem is that you will only perpetuate the dualism. You are all the time reinforcing this belief in uh, being different. So what I just say is that, yes, of course, we have to go for this cosmopolitan solidarity, but without humanitarianism, focusing on what is most important, on sentience. The compassion yeah. just be not about human essences, but of course, about anyone who is sentient. And, and that's my, my claim to, to contribute to the cosmopolitan view. And if I may, I would like to say something uh, that we have not commented, and is to stress the amazing, excellent introduction Natalie wrote for this book. Yes. It's one of those introductions that I it's, agree. <laughs> it's like a, a handbook of the, the most important theoretical perspectives that we dissect in the book. She mm -hmm. went one by one, discussing, introducing them, discussing them, and uh, well, I think it's one of the you know, the treasures of this book, this introduction that he worked so hard, Natalie, I remember you reviewing and reviewing again this very long chapter, which is the first one, the introduction. And we have not mentioned because we were talking just about chapters, but it's it's one of the most important parts of the book. So I just wanted to make mention of this for anyone. I, I'm sure yeah. it will be one of those texts that people will be using isolated from the book because it summarizes so well everything. Yeah. Well, I have to actually thank you, Nuria, because, um, you know, I have been very interested in supporting animal rights, you know, for over 30 years um, and in activism and whatnot. Um, however, I um, never really um, um, started my academic foray into animal rights before I met you, Nuria. So the first time I started like writing and publishing is after a conference uh, in Ireland, I think it was 2014, that I heard Nuria's talk. And I specifically went there because this was a one talk about, uh, talked about animal rights and veganism. I was very interested. I went to the talk, I introduced myself afterwards to Nuria um, she has published, uh, she had published at the time uh, on uh, animal rights. And I was, um, I was very impressed with, with her, um, you know, publications and with her uh, skills and with her public uh, speaking. And I, uh, you know, tried to interest her in, in working with me. And, um, you know, she actually agreed and we had a fantastic working relationship. I learned so much about, um, you know, research, about publishing um, and just about, you know, um, I guess how you how you tackle these issues from Nuria, um, you have been a tremendous role model. Thank you so much. I think you overestimated my my uh, my talk in Ireland. I remember very well that I think it was 2013, and I was just starting to publish a non-human animal critical animal studies. It was really that was my first conference where I brought a critical animal studies paper. And I had to have to say it was so encouraging for me, you coming after the talk, because I would say that the rest of the audience was just looking at me and you. And what's that? That's a new topic here. Uh, it was not, uh, I think probably it was the single paper on critical animal studies in the whole conference. So I felt rather like starting something there alone. And when you came, and introduce it yourself. And we had such a good time during this, the rest of the conference together. So I, I say the same to you. Thank you so much, Natalie, for being there. 
you're a great team that's that's evident <laughs> we have these results with as this book for instance and i, I totally agree with you nuri i think the introduction uh, natalie wrote is a piece uh, any critical animal studies teacher would use in their in their course and i'm, I'm going to do that too <laughs> fortunately if i can keep teaching uh, these issues so well unfortunately uh, we are almost uh, arriving to the end i would have uh, questions for another session but i guess we we need to finish but i would like just to make the last question for you uh now thinking about advocates bo both for animal advocates and like migrant uh, um, Global South uh, refugee uh, issues uh, advocates too. Like, what would you recommend? How could they um, better include the other point into their struggle? Just as a final reflection to to finish uh, this this talk. I think Nuria, you probably would have a really good answer, so I'll let you answer it. You, uh, Laura, you, you refer to scholars from the borders and all the other area. Yeah, not the scholars, but activists. Like, how do you think oh. activists uh, can kind of nourish from these uh, yeah. theories mm -hmm. and include them in their advocacy? Well, wow. human animals and, and refugees. Oh. Human rights advocates, the majority of them has not have not identified the speciesism paradox in their work. Mm -hmm. So I think if the book, the, the, the book, I mean, I, I cannot tell them what to do. I would, I would say first, they need to realize the species is paradox that they, they have behind their work. And uh, for the animal advocates, there is also a paradox in some cases, which is that this intersectionality must be also acknowledged. Uh, because we cannot fight for non-human animals if we also do not have in our in our mind the, the the human struggle. I mean, it's impossible. So in both cases, it's uh, my, my humble recommendation would be to to identify this this gap, this problem behind their advocacy in the cases in the cases of of human human rights advocates uh, the majority of them still need to, to include the species issue in the case of animal advocates i think they are much more because a number of them come from human rights so it's yeah. different but still of course the intersectionality in some cases is not uh, it's welcomed because for mm -hmm. some animal advocates it's like Wow, we are again, again, uh, mixing humans with this uh, mm -hmm. animal defense. We are again not giving priority to non-humans. And I am not saying this. Of course, um, yeah. my, my view, we have to give priority to the worst of, and the worst of are the non-human animals, that's sure. So nothing to do with not giving priority to non-human animals, but we cannot, um, in my view, we cannot address the non-human animal struggle if uh, we are not compassionate also for humans, my view. Yeah, yeah, I would add, you know, start with, with your own language, if you will, you know, uh, ask yourself, why do you call animals, other animals, it? Why do you talk about, you know, the cow as it, um, given all the information, all the scientific knowledge that they are not an object? Um, you start with that. Start with, you know, exploring expressions that you hear or you use yourself, such as, you know, oh, they killed him like a dog. Why is it okay to kill a dog? Why use mm -hmm. such exp an expression or to kill two birds with one stone? Why such very, very species uh, expressions? Um, you know, start with that. Um, and if you are in some um, specific uh, social um, uh, rights tradition, such as, for instance, black issues, familiar, familiarize yourself with um, the best uh, knowledge in that field, such as the co-sisters, or there are many black activists who have written on animal rights, um, and you would, you know, you would benefit a lot from a lot from that. Yeah. 
Fantastic. I think with that we can uh, finish this talk. I'm very grateful for both of us for your time and all your explanations. And yeah, thank you very much. I hope our audience um, is convinced now to read the book and, and uh, go deep into the, the arguments. So thank you very much and hope we can see you soon also in another title. Thank you. Thank you for having us.